Hi and welcome to Woman at the Wheel, uh, my YouTube channel. I lied. I was going to go down the road a ways and start up, but I feel like a different person. I had my breakfast, um, the fog and the sky and all that's gone. The clouds in the sky are gone. My headache is actually starting to go away. So I had my um, egg and bacon bites that I showed you on the, on the last video. And uh, I'm drinking my mocha latte decaf. <laughs> I just like saying mocha latte. So I give um, Pennsylvania uh, turnpike service plazas a big A freaking plus. Super clean. Um, they had the right kind of food in there. They actually have the vendors people want to buy stuff from. Just pretty awesome. And although their fuel is outrageously expensive at $6.09 a gallon for diesel, they're still better than, than uh, almost everybody else that's not on the turnpike. So they do have pretty much the lowest priced fuel of any place. Well, I don't know if you noticed it when I pulled in back on that other side. If you've watched that video, you probably saw a flatbed truck. I mean, I think I called him an asshole um, on video, not him to his face, because I didn't see him anywhere around. He's probably hiding somewhere because he's an idiot. He had parked his flatbed truck across the lanes that are set up there so that you can pull in with a truck or a truck and a trailer and be able to park and then you can pull out the other side of it. For some reason this guy parked right across like and blocked like four truck spots. So <laughs> while I was sitting there eating my egg and bacon bites, this truck comes around the wrong way and he pulls up in front of me and it's not a not a super long box truck, probably 24 foot box truck. Pulls up in front of me and he, he backs into one of those spaces that the guy had blocked off by parking across the end of it. So I know he was thinking the same thing about the guy I was thinking. He was thinking, you're an asshole <laughs> blocking the spaces we need to park in. So I wasn't alone in my judgment, I don't think. I'm just guessing. I didn't ask him what he thought, but from the look on his face, I think that's what he thought. Man, I feel so much better. I feel like a new person. So I'm coming up on my exit. It's a good thing I stopped where I did because I am going through Wheeling, West Virginia. That's where I-70 goes. <clears throat> when I lived out here, I lived in Pittsburgh for a little while and then I lived up north of Wheeling in West Virginia for a little while. And then I lived in Ohio. And what I was doing is I was working in nuclear power plants. So I was finding places to stay, cheap places to stay. Um, while I went and worked at those plants. Got to be getting to this exit up here somewhere. It said a mile. It's been a long mile. Four tenths of a mile, okay. So I want to get off 76 here. 76 continuing on down is still the turnpike. Uh, I can just get on I 70 here and get off the turnpike system, I think. I think this will put me off of it. Good old Pittsburgh. You should never underestimate what a decent meal 
and a decent cup of coffee can do for your to raise your spirits. <laughs> These are their toll gates, and they, they don't take cash at all. What they'll do is they'll, you either have to have a, a pass or you have a, and they'll take a picture of your license plate and send you a bill. So that's what they'll do, they'll send me a bill. I do have a Oklahoma tag on here. Okay, truck guy. It's kind of a cute thing you're trying to do there, but we won't both fit. There's a truck trying to come around the left side of me on the ramp. So get out of his way. Clearly I'm in his way, the way he's acting, so... Diesel, $5.99. Something sounds really weird. I guess that's wind. That shouldn't be wind. It wasn't windy when I stopped a while ago. Must be something with this pavement. Yeah, it was that pavement. I guess. I don't like that when I get a weird sound I can't identify. Yeah, it's pavement related. So this pavement's got some kind of weird texture or something to it. It's making a strange noise. As long as it's not my truck, that's all right. Okay, good. Noise quit. Definitely that pavement. I was starting to worry. <laughs> I was like, am I sure? I don't know. Maybe sorry I got off of I-76. We got right into a shitty construction zone. I'm very, very impressed with Pennsylvania's um, Turnpike Plaza, uh, service plazas. Mains weren't anywhere near as nice. Mains were, in fact, kind of icky. Massachusetts, they were old and kind of icky. Oklahoma's are, they've redone them in the last oh, 20 or 30 years, but they're kind of getting old and icky. And they don't have Starbucks. They've got McDonald's. And, uh, convenience stores. <clears throat> but I think they had, I think Hardee's was in there too. Hardee's and Starbucks and a convenience store. And this wasn't like a Starbucks kiosk like you'll see in Target stores or in um, Safeway or City Market or different stores where they actually have a little Starbucks inside the store. It was a full-blown Starbucks. And they had like five people working in there. So I'm going to say they get a lot of traffic. So 
So the little girl that was making my cafe mocha here, my venti decaf cafe mocha, <laughs> or whatever, mocha latte. She put too much whipped cream on the top of it. They actually do. If, if, unless you tell them different, they'll put whipped cream on it. I thought, well, that's okay. I, I can do that. It's not super sweet, but it's sweet enough I don't have to add anything to it. Um, so I, I said, yeah, go ahead and put that on there. Well, she put it on there, she put the lid on, and a lot of the whipped cream came out the top of the cup. <laughs> so this cup looks like it's been, I don't know, stabbed or something. There's there's coffee all over the outside of the cup. She was trying to clean it up. She kind of got to laughing, and I got to laughing. So she says... Well, she says, I, I kind of overdid it with the, the coffee, so I don't want to cheat anybody on the coffee, so I fill it up pretty full, and then I put the whipped cream on, and then the whipped cream just comes out the top when I put the lid on, and I said, well, where I come from, we call that put, trying to stuff a 10-pound pig into a 5-pound sack, and she just looked at me, and she started laughing, so evidently she hadn't heard that before. She's a kid. She's all apologetic. I'm like, no worries. This is, this is great. I'll take it just like that. See how much nicer I am when I'm actually fed and and coffeeed up. Well, decafed up anyway. And don't have a damn headache. So yeah, I can be actually almost a decent human being sometimes go figure in other words I'm not always a cranky old hag so I think even the truck is feeling better it's getting 11 miles to the gallon even though we're up and down hills This is a pretty good hill. Plenty steep. I feel like I've been driving for two days. <laughs> I've been driving for an hour and 46 minutes. It's crazy. I'm really happy with the strap situation. Everything's staying tight. Knock on wood. These ratchet straps are like pretty much everything else Chinese made. It's a nice old barn. That's a big one. Um, and I've busted a few of them. The handles seem to, the rivet on the handle breaks, comes apart, so I've got a couple handles I need to salvage the hooks off of and put new handles on or whatever, or use the hooks for, um, to, what I do is I buy these straps, they're 20 foot straps or 30 foot, whatever they are, and that's just too much strap to be working with the way I'm strapping these together, like I showed you, um, this morning I strap them just from the, the top stake pocket to the bottom stake pocket of the bottom trailer so the top trailer is compressing the center trailer to the bottom trailer holds everything together it's like a really tightly uh, smashed sandwich kind of and so the straps themselves don't need to be 20 feet long because then I've just got a bunch of strap ends I've got to worry about shaking loose so what I I did was I got a whole box of new straps, 
because my old straps were mostly just falling apart and rotten. And I trimmed them. Uh, I trimmed, I think, 12 or 14 of them to about um, 10 feet. And I saved all the ends of the new ones because if I can find somebody who has a sewing machine and who can do it to, so that it'll pass muster um, for the strength, they have to meet a certain strength, so there's a certain way they have to be sewn. And there used to be a guy somewhere in Oklahoma who would sew the, the straps for you to the, um, to the hooks. But you can reuse that hook part too. So I've been saving anything that breaks, I save the hooks off of it. Because those hooks are getting hard to find, you can't hardly buy them. Part of the shortage thing, I guess. That's a nice barn too. There's nothing like a bad barn in my book. I might as well quit saying that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> they're all nice barns so anyway uh, that's what I'm going to do I'm going to uh, salvage as many ends as I can off the broken handles because they're cheap Chinese bullshit and they break real easy and uh, just save the hooks the hooks don't seem to be they're not like falling apart like the rest of them So that way I can maximize uh, the number of straps I have. My problem is that I'm going to have fewer um, ratchet ends than I'm going to have straps, but I'm going to have to just start you know, buying ratchet ends or something at yard sales or whatever, or hunt up all my old ones. The ratchet ends hold up better than the straps when they're stored for some reason. but. I had all my stuff stored for a long time, like seven or eight years, what what I didn't sell when I retired the first time. But I sold a lot of stuff. I sold a lot of my straps. I sold a lot of my chains. I think I kept back two or three chains, maybe four, and a couple of boomers for the chains, and then some ratchet straps, and sold all the other stuff. And I hope I never have to use chains again. Chain and stuff is, we, we use the chains when we move my husband's backhoe. But that's the only thing we chain. Chain and stuff down to move it, that's, I don't want to even go there. It's just too hard, too much work. You know, 10 years ago, it didn't bother me, but that was 10 years ago. <laughs> getting a little older now. I don't want to be crawling around on a flatbed chain and shit down. It's enough to have to crawl up on these trailers. I don't know if you noticed um, how high the neck of those trailers are. Well, I've got the two straps coming down from the top of the, uh, the trailer necks. I had to crawl up there and put that on there. It's not like it gets up there on its own, and I'm going to have to crawl up there and take it off when I get to Texas. That's going to be the trickier part, actually. Um, that's the one place I can't, my husband made me a tool that I can put the strap on, um, the hook into the strap, I can put it on there and then reach up and set it in the top stake pocket, but because of the way that's sitting, it's hard to do that um, when you have to turn to catch the top of the neck, so I had to do that by hand, and I'm going to have to crawl up there and get them loose the same way, so not looking forward to that, because I really don't like climbing on these things. I've never been like great at dealing with being at, at any kind of a height off the ground. And I'm naturally kind of clumsy anyway, so I have to be really super conscientious about what I'm doing every second I'm up on these trailers. And I'm always hanging on with at least one hand to something. Because uh, the last thing I want to do is take a tumble off of one of those. Three feet doesn't sound like a long way to fall if you fall off the bottom trailer. But you can kill yourself falling three feet too, so you know, I'm trying not to ever do that, ever fall off that, so. But that's probably the most difficult thing that I do um, in this particular uh, line of work, hauling trailers, is the, the most physical hardest thing is getting the straps up on the neck sometimes. Other than that, it's not, I mean, yeah, it's kind of a little bit of, it's hot work. There's another barn, another cool barn. <laughs> it's a lot of hot work in the summer, strapping loads. I mean, it gets miserably hot. 
you know, it's already been hot a couple of days when I went out and strap loads. So I don't know. I don't really want to haul strap loads all summer. But if they pay like this one is paying, then I may have to do it anyway, whether I like it or not, because it was literally too good of a deal to turn down. For, for this load, I'm going to make more than I made hauling a trailer from Kansas to Baltimore and hauling a trailer from Baltimore back to Kansas. Uh, so that's how good this load pays. It's just amazingly good. And uh, so even though I was disheartened and pissed off and aggravated yesterday um, and I thought they were going to close on me and I wasn't going to get the load, I'm, I'm glad it did because I was to the point where I was thinking, well, I, I hope they are closed and I don't even have to get the load. Let's turn and go home. <laughs> I get pissy sometimes, I admit it. I was being dramatic and pissy. So by the time I actually talked to them, I was, I kind of got over being pissy once I realized they didn't just go off and leave me, you know, because I drove a long way to get there to pick them up. And uh, they knew that. Now, I don't know if my broker said anything to them, but when, when he called me and said that they were talking about closing at 3.30, I was pretty pissed off. And I, I told him, I said, they better fucking not. <laughs> You know, like, what am I going to do? You know, and if they'd have been gone, they'd have just been gone. But So I'm not sure what he told them, but he might have said something like, she's really mad. Don't you, don't you dare leave till she gets there. And rightfully so. I mean, I drove a day and a half to go up there out of my way to go get those trailers. Of course, I didn't do it out of the kindness of my heart either. I did it, you know, for the money. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, <laughs> I was doing it as, as, as a favor to them or something, because that's not the case. But when I got there, they were just super nice. Whoever he talked to was probably some kid that was just wanting to leave early on Friday, you know. But there were a few people there when I got there. And the, the main guy, he, he didn't even leave till right before I left. And it, it took me quite a while to get everything um, strapped down and inspected and doing my because when I when I get these trailers I do a lot with them more than just hook them up and go so it's kind of a process it takes me anywhere from half an hour to an hour basically well it took a little longer because we were having problems finding the paperwork to go along with it so um, it was a good thing that, that the head guy stuck around. He finally did find all the paperwork to go with the load. I couldn't have, you know, I, I guess I could have taken it on his signature. That wouldn't have been a problem. But then the dealership down here wouldn't have had the, the booklets on them or the, any of the paperwork. So that worked out all right. But it just took him a while to find it. But by that time, I'd calmed down and... <laughs> quit being pissed and <laughs> I'll tell you sometimes it's it's uh, trial and tribulation having a, a, a redhead's Irish temper that's what I've got I'm not actually a redhead um, I used to be a brunette with red highlights maybe <laughs> but I'm definitely um, Scotch Irish extraction and and I got the temper to, to prove it. I'm not sure that the Irish have anything on the Scots for bad temper. That seems to be a, a famous theme on my dad's side of the family. People having temper. Look at these bridges. Love crossing rivers and bridges and seeing the structure of the bridges. Even though it creeps me out a little bit crossing big rivers. Now I think that's the Allegheny River that we just crossed. It meets up with the Monongahela River in Pittsburgh. That might have been the Monongahela. It was one of the two probably. Um, and when the Monongahela and the Allegheny meet, they form the Ohio River at Pittsburgh. That's where the Ohio River is formed by those two rivers. I used to fish there quite a bit. 
there's a baseball stadium right on the Ohio River in Pittsburgh, and they've got a like a, a walkway along the river there. And so I and I used to fish a lot. Well, I used to go down there and fish. That was the one thing I could do in in a city that seemed normal to me <laughs> was go fishing. Even though the place that I went fishing was odd. Oh, this coffee is so good. I was tempted this morning for about three minutes to walk over to Bob Evans that was by my motel and have breakfast over there and then I realized that no I didn't really feel like doing that I don't like going in and sitting down in a restaurant by myself it just seems kind of creepy and sad to me so I usually don't do it I've done it a couple times but I usually don't But Bob Evans is a, a restaurant chain out here in the, mostly in the Midwest from like Pennsylvania over to, well, they, they're in Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. I think there might be one or two in Missouri. And maybe even one down toward Kansas or somewhere, maybe, I don't know. But they, they're kind of in the upper Midwest. And 35 years ago when I lived out here they were the best place around to go for breakfast and they still are really but now they're it's like they've gone from being a real popular family restaurant to being an old fogies restaurant <laughs> so the couple of times I've gone there um, I had a couple of loads where I, I could actually get in the parking lot um, somewhere I, I couldn't remember where it was but I actually got in the parking lot with a, with a horse trailer on. So I went in, sat down, Nate, and everybody in there was older than me, and I'm old. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Used to be, that was where everybody went. Everybody went to Bob Evans, you know, for, for breakfast. It was the, the place, and now it's just a, just a place for old farts to, <laughs> to go hang out and eat their bacon and eggs I guess it, just, it's, it cracked me up so that's how life is though you know when you're young you don't appreciate it one little bit you just figure you're going to live forever and everything's great and by the time you figure out how great being young really is it's too late because you're old <laughs> and then you're you're kind of screwed because you can't turn back the clock. You can't go back. So whoever said youth is wasted on the young was absolutely right. It sure was on me. I did not appreciate the things that I had. I, in fact, I was so super critical of myself that I, you know, I've spent all my life criticizing myself instead of enjoying the good, the good things I had. Now that some of those things are are no longer, I don't have them anymore. Now I appreciate them. But I'm still super critical though of myself. I don't think that'll ever change. Monongahela, that's the name of the river. That's what I was saying, Monongahela. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. What the hell did she say? <laughs> so that may have been the Monongahela River we crossed back there. If it's not, we'll cross it up here somewhere. 
and then we'll cross the Ohio River over at um, Wheeling, West Virginia, I think, or going into West Virginia anyway. Pretty sure you cross the Ohio between Pennsylvania and West Virginia, I think. <laughs> oh. I try and keep my geography straight. Sometimes I do a better job than other times. This is definitely a slow part of the trip because a lot of this road is 55 miles an hour. I hope I get as far as I have planned to get today because I plan to get cleared down by Nashville. We will see. I may not. Or I might do better. You never know. There's one of those wisteria trees or a wisteria vine in a tree maybe. Lowry's Western Shop. I wish I could find like a good Western thrift store <laughs> where I could get me some some gently used um, snap front Western shirts for work shirts. I keep threatening to go to on to um, eBay and buy some more. It's where I usually get them. more of that noisy pavement that must have a, a funky texture to it borough of Bentleyville Bentleyville PA kind of a picturesque little burg big assembly of God church I went to the Assembly of God Church for a little while. That was a different experience. Quite different. Some of it was actually a little shocking to me. <laughs> I was raised in the Church of Christ which is a very, I don't know, real plain Jane kind of church. They don't do anything flashy or loud or anything like that. So to go from that to Assembly of God was an eye opener. I'm trying to think of what I can tactfully say about that and I think the best I can say is if you've never been to an assembly of God and if you've never seen um, people speaking in tongues it's really something to see <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'll say about that it was interesting And that's one of the topics I've sworn not to talk about is religion. The two are religion and politics. I'll, I'll stick my toe into the politics every once in a while with just my opinion. But I'm not out to convert anybody to my, my ideas in either category. Everybody already knows what they think about both of those topics. So why argue about it?
besides, if I wanted to argue, especially about politics, all I got to do is go on the internet and I can argue all day and night and find plenty of people willing to go toe-to-toe. <laughs> Complete strangers. It's not exactly how I want to spend my time. I don't know. Some people do. Um, more power to them if that's what they like to do, but... I think I'd rather do other stuff. Like, look at barns. Look at these barns. <laughs> That's what I'd rather do. Drive around and look at barns. These are huge damn barns. I mean, they're really big. I'm trying to figure out what all they did with them to have them that big. I mean, I'm sure they stored hay in them. Maybe in the, in the lower part, maybe they had a milking barn. Maybe in the middle part they had stalls. I don't know. There are, some of them are just gigantic. You can probably get half a Craig, Colorado in some of these barns. They're so big. Now I'm hoping that when we get down into Kentucky, um, I don't know if we'll see any or not, but they do a deal in Kentucky that they've started doing other places, but these other places stole the idea from Eastern Kentucky that's where it came from um, in eastern Kentucky they got all these tobacco barns and other barns and they started putting like a quilting block a painted quilting block so they take a block like from a quilt patchwork deal paint it on a board and put it up on the side of the barn it was like a tourist thing you know get people coming out and spending time in their countryside well you're seeing that spreading across the country now there are some people in my part of the world that do that but they've been doing that for a long time in Kentucky my sister and I were out there and and one of the things we did one day was drive around and look at the barns with the quilting squares on them and uh, took pictures of them. she took pictures of a lot of them I didn't take so many pictures because I'm not a photographer really she's a really good photographer so she was taking pictures of them and but now that's kind of spreading, but hopefully when we get down in here, we'll see some of that. And of course, if we do, you know, I'll, I'll point it out, obviously. It's kind of my job, uh, as far as the video thing goes. I'm kind of like a, a yakky tour guide who <laughs> doesn't know all the details. I mean, this is pretty much what you would get if you rode along with me in real life, so. The only other thing about it is you'd be able to interject a couple of words here and there. When I shut up, you could say something. But I think my husband would probably agree that this is pretty much how I am when he's riding around with me. <laughs> or when I'm riding around with him. <laughs> uh, I know some of you are thinking that poor guy. I could hear it be nice <laughs> I will be glad to get out of the hills very glad I'm about hilled out So we're coming up on Washington, Pennsylvania, which is pretty much the last decent sized town before we cross over into West Virginia. So we're getting there. Slow going, I mean, this is just a slow part of the country to get through, but we will. That 84, that's, that's one of those places that makes you wonder how people decided on a name of a place. 84 what? What does that mean? Somebody look it up, because I have no idea. Oh, poor deers. Dang it. Hate that.
just such a picturesque part of the world. You know, the hills and the farms and the old churches and all this stuff is really kind of lovely. hearing weird stuff. I don't know what the heck I'm hearing. I think something slid off my back seat or something. I don't know. That was a strange sound. Almost sounded like something sliding across the top of the truck. There's nothing up there to slide. Really weird. going on back there. All my straps are good and tight. Everything's holding. It's what I want to see when I look back there. I don't want to see anything wiggling and wobbling around. Oh, I was going to tell you about making these ratchet straps work. <laughs> I think like an hour ago. So anyway, when I first got these straps, my old straps I never had that much trouble with, but these new ones were a different brand. And what I noticed was when I'd go and strap things up, it'd stay for a while and then it'd wiggle loose and then I'd have some that would, I just couldn't get them to stay tight. They would just wiggle loose and wiggle loose again and I'd be stopping four, five, six times to tighten them up. Well, my husband solved the mystery for me. Um, he, he was reading up on them and these Chinese straps, you can't start them, you have to start them out a ways and get two or three good wraps before um, they'll catch, before they'll stay. The older ones, you, you could pull them relatively tight and then start ratcheting them down. You're still going to get a couple wraps around the little bale in there. But for some reason, these will slip unless you, so when I put them on, I don't tighten them up and then start cranking them. I hold them out away from the trailer a little bit so there's some slack and then I start cranking them to get a couple of wraps around there before it ever puts any tension on it. That cured the problem. So just in case you're having a problem with your straps and they're the, the newer Chinese ones, that's probably the issue. Now that's one of those things. I might have eventually figured it out. I might not have. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say I'm that smart about figuring out solutions to problems. I've had. I mean, I've figured out some pretty creative solutions to some problems as I've had to. But it's like necessity for me is the the definitely the mother of invention. So I've have a knack for getting myself into situations and I got to get myself out of them so sometimes I have to get creative with cures for the things I do my my own self <laughs> here's a good example when I was trucking back in 2010 when I started trucking I had never really driven a, a dual wheel truck so I didn't really know anything about dualies on the back so it never occurred to me that you could get anything stuck in there between those wheels. So um, one day I was down in Decatur, Texas, and I pulled in a parking lot across the road from the Starbucks. That Starbucks, you can't even get close to it with a pickup even because it's so tight, the parking lot. So there was a lot over, about a half block over, that I could pull off in there. Everything else was full. I couldn't find any other place to park. So I went in there and got my Starbucks, came back out, and I looked, or I went to get fuel down the road. And I stopped to get the fuel, and um, I looked at the, my back tire, and I see this rock stuck in between my tires. And I'm like, well, shit, <laughs> that can't stay there. 
because one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to wear a hole in my tire and destroy the tire, or it's going to come out of there as I'm going down the road and fly up and hit somebody and kill them. So I've got to get it out of there. And I had no idea how I was going to do this. I didn't have anything to really like stick in there and pry against, even if I could pry it. I mean, I had my um, my deal I used for um, tightening up my chains or, you know, the pry bar for that, but it didn't seem like that was really going to work because I had nothing to force it against and uh, nothing that without tearing up the tire. So I thought, i got to figure out a way to do this without using anything sharp. <laughs> so preferably not poking any holes in the tire. So what I ended up doing is I used a strap. I used a ratchet strap. I thought, okay, the ratchet strap's not gonna hurt the tire at all. And if I can just get it around behind the rock and kind of like a sling, like you put a rock in a slingshot. So I put this ratchet strap around that and I rigged it up to the headache rack of the truck for leverage and uh, got it where it was relatively tight so I, I knew I had tension on it and I could see that it was gonna I could kind of see that it would work so I just ratcheted it until that thing popped out of there so it did it popped the rock out from between the tires <laughs> and you know didn't make any holes in my tires and nobody's windshield had to get busted because I couldn't get it loose so that was one of my more creative solutions to a problem and I'm sure everybody at the gas station was thinking, what is this crazy woman doing? Because <laughs> here I am, ratcheting something from under my truck. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> now, the things I can't figure out, I usually... I'll try and figure things out, and if I can't figure it out, I'll call my husband, because if, if I can't figure it out, he'll know the answer. He'll know what to do. Or he can think about it a minute and figure out what I should do. He's real analytical, and he's a real good troubleshooter. I think I probably already said it a few times, but he is like the machine whisperer. So anything mechanical, he can figure it out. It's like that's his the way he thinks is he is just what he does okay this is Washington Pennsylvania here You're seeing some of the old buildings down in there. It's kind of hard to see anything from the interstate. But hopefully you're getting some scenery. Those down there, that's old steel mills. All those huge factory looking buildings down in there. I believe anyway. The <laughs> truck's got a tail. It's got a little red tail. Bob Evans, dog on it. <laughs> oh, poor old Bob Evans. That's okay, I'm still crying over the loss of all the old roadside diners we used to have where you could stop and get a piece of homemade pie and a cup of coffee.
some people clearly don't understand the whole concept of merging. So we're 25 miles out of Wheeling, West Virginia. Means we've got a few more hills to go through, but not a whole bunch, I don't think. So it seems like it flattens out once we get past Wheeling. I hope so, because I'm tired of hills already. Had enough. I've had, what, three straight days of hills? I may or may not go down through Kentucky. I may change my mind to going out through Indianapolis and then cut down um, on 57, 55 to Memphis. It might be a more beneficial route, fuel consumption wise. As far as I am from Seguin, it's pretty much any route that's gonna get me there is gonna be comparable time wise. So now I'm more concerned about fuel. The more fuel I can conserve, uh, the better the profit will be, obviously. And if I can conserve fuel and get cheaper motels by going that route, I may do that. Because there's a motel down in there I can stay at if I can get to it. The question is, do I have time? <laughs> we will find out, I guess, if I go that way. I'm leaning towards it. Um, that route, the only bad spot really is Indianapolis. The only real heavy traffic, and being a weekend, it probably shouldn't be so bad. It won't be like going through there on a weekday. So I may just plan on doing that. Save Kentucky for a different, for another time. Because Kentucky is not short on hills either. So I'm leaning towards that now that I think about it. I think that's probably a better plan. If I go down through Nashville, the motels are super expensive down in there. That one I stayed at last night just about killed me. It was like... It turned out to be $20 less than they quoted me because they had a $20 fee on there for incidentals, which I think is code for keeping people out who don't have money to pay it or something. Because <laughs> what incidentals, you know. It's not like you use a telephone in a hotel room anymore to make long-distance calls like we used to. So there's really nothing for them to add to your bill. They don't have room service. So I don't, I don't know. But it was, they initially charged me 187 bucks, which is the most I've ever been charged for a motel. Then they knocked that 20 off, so it's 167. I've paid that much for a couple of motels. One in Odessa, like 10 years ago. It's the last hotel room in the region, and they jacked the hell out of it. And I had to have it. I had a load down there, and it was in the middle of winter. I couldn't sleep in the truck. I would have froze to death, so I had to pay it. And then uh, somewhere else, Oh, Chicago. I had a load in Chicago, right in town, and the motels there were expensive. But 
yeah, if I can have cheap motels from here on out, I'd be a lot happier. I mean, I understand that a dollar's not worth shit anymore, really, that it's worthless paper that has been destroyed by stupid economic practices of the government. <laughs> but still, uh, anything over $100 for one night just seems extremely excessive to me, unless it's like got a gold-plated toilet in there and they come in and rub your feet and feed you cookies and milk before you go to sleep. And none of them do that. You're lucky if you get a clean room and you're lucky if you don't run into any bugs which that's like I was saying earlier that's the biggest benefit of a high dollar motel I've never seen bugs in a high dollar motel and I attribute this to them probably getting pest control in on a regular schedule instead of letting it get out of hand because it's not the motels that create the bed bugs it's nasty travelers who carry them around with them and drop them here and there So while it's not the motel's fault that they actually have pests occasionally drop in, it is their fault if they don't take care of them religiously, keep them from, you know, flourishing. But if you think about it that way, I mean, bed bugs have been around. They're not just bed bugs. I mean, they're bugs. They've been around forever, and they usually live outside. Uh, my mom was telling me, and she was... 90 when she died but she told me when she was a little girl real little they got bed bugs in their house one time out of uh, they went and got a load of wood somewhere you know for the fireplace they went and got that and it was full of bed bugs so I guess they had a hell of a time getting them out of the house so these bugs and stuff and cockroaches too they don't originate inside of a, a structure they're outside bugs that find their way in and then decide to live in is easy and they don't want to leave. <laughs> so I, in, in the south, I mean, even in Oklahoma, I've had cockroaches fly into my house and I catch them and kill them and get rid of them because I don't want them getting a foothold. Now, I've seen a lot of places that are just filthy with cockroaches, some nasty motels, but yeah, they, they didn't start out that way. It's not like they were just built with cockroaches in them. They got brought in by somebody. So I, that's, <laughs> that's the deal breaker for me when I look at reviews on motels. If it's, if it's like one complaint and it says bed bugs, but they're whining about a bunch of stupid shit. Then I kind of attribute that to one-upmanship. Like, they've got their complaint. Like, the clerk was rude to them or whatever. And then they didn't like the room, so they tried to get a refund. They wouldn't give them a refund. Then they'll escalate it and say, and they got bed bugs. Well, I kind of discount that kind of a report. But if the, if the um, review starts out, stay away from this place they got bugs then I stay the hell away from that place and even if they just mention it in one I usually if unless that's the only hotel I can get to I might you know not give it that much validity or weight if it seems like they're just whining and trying to one up on the complaints but for the most part that's a deal breaker for me because I do not want that kind of vermin getting into my suitcase and then coming home with me can you imagine oh my god <laughs> no uh, don't think so you know I'm not like the best housekeeper at home myself anyway I don't need something like that adding to my problems not the worst either but I'm not like a fanatic As strange as it sounds, both of my brothers are better housekeepers than I am. And they're not girly guys either. They're manly men. They're just neater and tidier than I am. This guy's got too much boat. Look at that wag on that boat. Oh my God. 
He's got too much boat for that truck, what he's got. At least he's got sense to go slow. That was scary looking. I bet he's scared pulling it. That's got to be jerking him side to side on the road. It looked like the whole truck was getting swayed. Man. Panera Bread. Do you guys like going to those restaurants? Panera Bread. I went there once with my sister in Norman, Oklahoma. And I just didn't see what there was really to like about it. It had zero atmosphere. It was more like a college cafeteria atmosphere. And the food was so-so. The sandwiches. It was, it was okay. It went bad. But I just I didn't get the point of it. You know, even McDonald's has a certain um, aura about it. When you go to McDonald's, you know you're at McDonald's, but it was just like so nondescript. I just didn't get the point of it. But maybe I just was at a particularly bad one or something. Or just a particularly nondescript one. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. You know, they got kind of a fancy name. That guy just about sideswiped me. Got pretty damn close. And it's got a pretty fancy name and just didn't feel that, that like there was anything about it. And now I can't go there anyway because, you know, a bread store, I'm trying to eat ketogenically and not eat wheat. Not so much worried about sugar as I am wheats, grains. And I was listening to a deal yesterday. They were talking about the, about the worst thing for us is the seed oils. So all this oil stuff, all the vegetable oil and all the seed oils, the soy, soybean oils and all that is really terrible for us, evidently. It's never, until they started uh, mass producing this stuff, it was never considered any kind of food to begin with. So between the, the wheat, I guess any kind of ground up wheat flour is bad for you. And then the seed oils are doubly bad for you. And guess what's in bread? Mass produced bread. It's flour and seed oils and sugar. <laughs> so it's probably not the best stuff for us. So I, I kind of struggle with that concept because I, I love bread, but I like real bread, the kind I make at home. I like homemade bread with butter on it right out of the oven, all hot and melted, you know. I can eat that stuff all day and all night, but evidently even that's not so great. I guess if you could make it and have a couple of bites and be happy with it, you're alright, but if you eat very much of it, it's going to mess with you. So I don't go to any restaurants anymore that have just sandwiches or something because I don't want to eat the bread. That's why I'm so happy that Starbucks has these little egg bite things. There's no wheat, no, no uh, seed oils, nothing like that. It's just eggs, bacon, and cheese. And yeah, from the looks of it, they must puree it and then add the little bacon bits to it. And then they cook it. They cook those little egg bites. They look like a little hockey puck, about the size of a hockey puck, and they're the same shape. So they must have a little form that they put it in, and then they cook it in like a, a water bath of some kind, some kind of French cookery thing. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. 
Um, but anyway, it cooks it kind of slowly in, in water. I'm sure they got it in some kind of a container, a bag, or a form or something where it's not in the water directly, but it's cooking in the water, if you know what I mean. So I found a recipe for them, kind of a knockoff recipe on the internet. You can do the same thing um, cooking them in your oven, basically. Then they're pretty close. It's not, not a bad knockoff recipe. Okay, West Virginia. 169151. Very West Virginia. I'd expect to see a way station relatively soon. Oh god, people. Ah, oh, shit. When people do that kind of thing, it pisses me off. She got into my stopping space and I needed it. I damn near got her. Don't be stupid. Oh, fucking people. God. Sorry, that scared me. I thought it was gonna rear end her ass. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Calm down. That would ruin both our days in a big way if I had hit her. That shows you why it's important to leave stopping space for, you know, bigger vehicles because even though my load's only 14, 15,000 pounds, still took me a lot longer there to stop than it would have if it was just a truck. And that's with the help of the trailer brakes too. I've got trailer brakes on it and they're functioning. I don't have them turned up real high, but I got them. I usually run with them around two to three on a light load like this. If it's big heavy load, I'll run them a lot higher. But you don't want to burn them out either. You don't want to set them so high that they start smoking. <laughs> I've done that before. <laughs> but yeah, she she shouldn't have cut in like that. And man. I have no desire to get into any kind of a wreck ever. Especially not one where it's me doing something stupid like rear-ending somebody. That's what I mean when I say a lot of driving is just trying not to um, get screwed up by other people's dumb things they do. But she could have had me, I mean, that could have caused me to do the dumb thing of running into her. Because I wasn't expecting it, so I wasn't laying back far enough. If I'd got back farther and not been going as fast, it wouldn't have been as dramatic. So, good reminder to me. But also, if she hadn't cut into my stopping space, but I leave a lot of space between me and the vehicle in front of me just for that reason. So I don't want to have to jam on the brakes and get to a stop to keep from hitting somebody. And it's unfortunate that people don't know or don't think about the, the fact that cutting over in front of a truck, even a small truck, um, anything carrying a load is a damn dumb idea. I mean, if you're going to come over, go on up a ways and then come over. Leave plenty of room. So as much as I hate having people right up on my ass, I'd much rather have them behind me than in front of me, real close. That's why I pass people. I don't want to be right up on somebody that's going slower than me. For the same reason, I don't want to rear end anybody.
Okay, that got my adrenaline going. <laughs> Dang it. Cabela Drive, one mile owner, if that's like a Cabela store with their own Cabela Drive. I guess we'll find out since it's a half mile now. Yep, I would say it probably is because that looks like Cabela's up on a water tower. It's like their logo. They do have some kind of cool stores if you go in and look around. The only problem for me is they're too expensive. I'm cheap. I don't want to pay that much money for stuff. But it's fun to go in and look. I'm a great window shopper. <laughs> I'm just stingy about actually buying anything. Which is not to say that I don't buy stuff, because I do, and sometimes I buy um, even relatively expensive stuff, but I'm just picky about what that may be. So we get out of these hills, I'm just not going to have any idea what my fuel mileage really is going to be. It's been up, down, up, down. <clears throat> it's running right around 10 now. But when we come climbing up out here, it'll probably be different. If we climb up out of here, I can't remember. to Wheeling. Pretty sure Wheeling's where we cross the Ohio River. So it runs over north and kind of parallel with this road, I think, and then cuts south, southwest, down toward the Mississippi Gulf. So it does eventually flow into the Mississippi. And it's a big river. It's a very big river. Another picturesque old barn. That one looked like it was about ready to fall down. Okay, it's wanting me to Go to 470, get to Columbus. I don't know if I agree with that or not. Back out and take a look at it here. Looks to me like it's six of one, half a dozen at the other. Four seventy goes around the south side of Wheeling, and seventy goes around the north side of Wheeling. So, and then they join back up. So I'm not sure what the difference is. Uh, local traffic only. Okay. So they don't want us in Wheeling. They want us to stay the hell, hell out of Wheeling.
right. They don't want me there all going around the other way. Tunnel, five miles. I don't remember a tunnel down in here. Evidently, there's a lot of stuff I don't necessarily remember <laughs> that I think I should. <laughs> I mean, I drove this road. Maybe it's on 470. I don't know. Or maybe it's on 70. I can't remember it being there. Huh. Interesting. Exit 5A was to Columbus. That's where we're going, I guess, since they don't want us in Wheeling. We'll go around Wheeling. Behave ourselves. There's some reason they don't want people going through there, whether it's clogging up their local traffic or maybe their maybe the old I-70 going through there's in bad repair or something. All these houses way up on hills like that. I get vertigo just thinking of living someplace like that. <laughs> I don't think I'd want to live way up on a hilltop. I like flat ground, which is kind of weird considering I'm from the mountains. But I like flat ground to live on, to walk on, to mow, to cultivate. <laughs> all the above and even though I do live on a hill it's not a hill like that it's a gentle hill but it's mostly flat feeling anyway it's not very dramatic of a hill dang hills my fuel mileage just goes in the toilet every time we come up one of these long steep hills you have to suffer through it until we get out of them so I was thinking about that living on a hill business my husband and I looked it took us about 10 years to actually find the place we we're living in when we first went to Oklahoma we bought a place out at the lake, which you've seen on some of my videos, I think. If I post, I, I can't remember now if I posted it or not, but I intended to. Guy, what are you doing? You can't be in the lane with me. Go on. Shoo. <laughs> God. Kind of figured it out there at the end. Um, anyway, we bought a place at the lake when we first moved down there. Well, we've been working on that house off and on for 12 years. There was so much wrong with it, and he was so busy um, running his business that he didn't have time to do all this stuff. So we, we work on it a while, and then we, you know, we save up a little money, work on it a little more, and as time allowed. So we never really lived in that house. We lived out behind the house in a, a fancy travel trailer we got. So it wasn't bad. I mean, it was just tight quarters for a long time because we lived in it for about nine years. Well, that whole time. Well, not the whole time, but for the last eight or nine years of that, we were looking for a place to move to, actively looking for something with some ground. Because we found out that at the lake, it's 
kind of a funny deal. You don't own the land at the lake, but you own your improvements that are on the land. So we wanted something where we actually owned the land, anyway, to make a long story short. And we needed more room, because he had a lot of equipment and stuff for his business. And then we're both raised in the country, so we just wanted to spread out a little bit, anyway. So we looked and looked and looked. We looked at everything that came up for sale for years. And we put in offers on stuff because everything was overpriced. But we'd put in what we thought was a good offer and get turned down. And so we did that several times. And uh, finally we found the place we're in now. And we were so lucky to find it because it wasn't overpriced. It was actually very reasonable. We could actually afford it. Oh, this road's pretty beat up. And see what this is the Ohio River? Should be, I think. Yeah, it's the Ohio. So we're crossing the Ohio River. It's not as wide as the Mississippi, but that is a deep ass river. It's a big, deep, fast moving river. I used to fish down in here occasionally. So I'm in Ohio. Got to write that mileage down. 169, 164, Ohio. Yay. Man, we'll get out of the hills now for a while. So anyway, we found this place. We had, we, it was kind of funny because we had like this list compiled of what we were looking for in a place. And he wanted some place up on a hill because the place we were at at the lake was kind of down in a hole at the lake. So you didn't get the breezes and you didn't have a view. So he was a bit real big about having it up on a hill. Um, I wanted to be way up off the road because we got cats and I didn't want the cats getting run over getting down in the road. So I wanted to be way back off the road. And we wanted a place that was at least five or ten acres and that was on a road that wasn't all real busy but that was relatively close to town so it didn't take us all day to get into town for groceries or whatever and <clears throat> something that didn't have a, a modern house on something that had an older house something that needed fixed up preferably because we knew we didn't want to spend a whole bunch of money you know we didn't want to take out a loan for a bunch of money um, and it had to be two to three bedrooms. Um, so everything everything on our list, and he, he wanted a big shop. So everything on our list, this one place had it, but there was a caveat. It was full of mice, <laughs> it was disgusting. So we had to go in and basically gut the east half of it the kitchen and that had to be torn out completely and replaced and the bathroom had to be torn out and replaced that was really bad and then we had to add an extra bathroom so we did that and we've got it it's mostly done there's a little bit of trim work left to do but for the most part we got the remodeling done and we we didn't have to go into debt for the remodeling. We, we took out a small mortgage for the place. So we got it real reasonable. But it took us many years of looking and waiting to get it. When it came on the market, it was kind of interesting because, um, of course, my realtor knew I'd been looking. So she, she called and she said, you need to come look at this one. It just came on the market. I'm like, okay, we're on our way. So we went and looked at it. And my husband was a little skeptical, but I was like, we need to buy this, we need to do it now. Um, this is cheap. It's way cheap for what it is. And we can deal with the, the fixing it up. You know, because even though it was a lot of work, it was mostly cosmetic stuff except for the kitchen fixtures. And the kitchen that was in it needed torn out anyway. It was terrible. So we did. He, he said, okay, well, let's let's put an offer on it so we did and we had to wait till the next day to hear back because the guy had another some more people coming to look at it and so when we went through and looked at it the guy was right there I mean and this is the house he grew up in 
So, you know, we were respectful of that. We didn't say, oh, this place is just full of mouse shit and it's all disgusting. We're going to tear this out and tear that out. We didn't do any of that. We were like, oh, you know, talking about the good points of it. And uh, so we, you know, we put a positive spin on it because we didn't want him to think that we were trashing his house. <laughs> you know? And uh, evidently the people that came through later did just that. They were like, oh, uh, this is disgusting. I'd rip this out and do that. So he sold the house to us because of that. <laughs> and <laughs> it, was, it was ironic, you know, that, but it was a young couple with a little kid and the little kid, I guess, was screwing with everything in the house and he ended up slamming the guy's mother's, dead mother's cedar chest shut and it locked because he didn't have a key for it. So. He was not happy with those people. So anyway, I'm glad he wasn't because that, that's why he sold us the house. <laughs> you know, and he accepted our offer. But we, we just offered what he was asking because it was worth a lot more than what he was asking, even so. so. And I think they wanted to lowball him too, so <laughs> on top of everything else. So we, we did get the house we got it. And then we got in there after he left and we didn't know what, quite what we were going to do with it because it needed a lot, <clears throat> but it turned out the bedrooms <coughs> were were mostly okay. Um, they were the mice had been in them, but the walls were intact and and all that. So they just needed a good scrubbing down. Everything got cleaned and painted. We um, basically took the kitchen and the bathroom down to studs and started over in there. And we reconfigured a little bit as we went, and we completely moved the kitchen um, to a different... We slid it forward on the east end of the house by about 20 feet and turned the old kitchen into the utility room. So it, it all worked out pretty well. So now it's a more... It's a better layout for us. And we moved the door to the kitchen into the living room. So when we first got in there, the living room was just like a big box with one small window. And then the door to the kitchen was on the north end of it. We made a wider door on the east end so the morning sun comes in in there and put French doors out that end of the house and put a big window in the kitchen, so, or in the living room. So it's, it's a lot different feel to the house, but we didn't change a whole, we didn't change a whole lot of structure. We just kind of, you know, did more with doors and windows to open it up. So now it's really nice. I mean, it's we still got a little bit of work to do that has been sitting for the last few years with all the stuff that's gone on. Um, so we, right after we moved in there, my dad died. And uh, then my husband got sick, or we found out he was sick. He'd been sick for a long time, evidently. But we found out he was sick, and then um, dealing with all that, and then my mom died. So we haven't really <laughs> finished up what we started. And I knew when we moved in that it wasn't going to get done because that's the way it works. If you move into a house before it's finished, you're not going to get it finished in the same amount of time that you would have finished it if you'd have just got it done in the first place. So, um, so that's where we're at with that. But it took a long time to find that place. But it was it was unique for us. It was a unique experience because it, it hit every everything on our wish list both of our wish lists we we got in this one house so now the only other thing about it that uh, there's two things outside that I would change and probably will here if we can afford to do it in the next year or so it needs new fencing around the front. The side fences are pretty good. It's barbed wire fences around the sides and the back because our neighbor has cattle and I think he put those fences in. So those are in good shape. But the barbed wire fence going across the front of the property is not in good shape. It's got trees all growing up in it and the wires down in a lot of places in the, around the gate. So I would like to have that you know, new new barbed wire put in and maybe a little bit of cross fencing so if we wanted to get a donkey or a goat or something, we could. <laughs> Don't ask me why we'd want to get a donkey or a goat, but 
if we wanted to have some kind of livestock in there, we could do it. Uh, right now, it's the fence out front wouldn't hold them. And the other thing I'd like to do is widen the culvert. And actually, Bill's got um, a couple of long culvert things that he, he salvaged from another deal that he can put in there. It's just a matter of getting down there and getting it done when he feels like doing it or whatever. And the reason I'd like to do that is so that I can pull in there with a the trailer on. I can get up there with a short trailer, but I can't get up there with a longer trailer or with double trailers. And sometimes, not real often, but sometimes I bring trailers home and stay overnight there and then go. So like if I pick up something on a weekend and it doesn't have to be there till Monday or Tuesday, then I can go home and it'll sit in the yard and then I can just leave from the house. I don't have to go back and pick it up. And I've done that a few times. And usually what I end up doing is taking them over to my sister-in-law's house because she doesn't have, um, I can get right in to her ground right off the road and get in there and park a long trailer or doubles and have room to turn around and get them out again. But I don't like imposing on her like that. I mean, that is an imposition. And she's probably a little leery anyway, because about 10 years ago, I did run over one of her trees. <laughs> I had my 40-foot trailer on, and I was backing it down in the yard. I thought I was well away from everything. I forgot all about that tree, and it was dark. And of course, Bill was trying to guide me from the back, and he was trying to stop me, and I didn't see him trying to stop me. So I backed right over her little redbud tree and broke it. So we had to buy her a new redbud tree. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure she's a little leery of me parking in her yard. And I, I still feel bad. I laugh, but I laugh because it's embarrassing. Uh, not because it's so much funny. Um, so if I could do those two things, then it would just make it... That would finish up the outside stuff. And then hopefully, if he gets to feeling like he can do it, or if he can get somebody to do it, maybe we can get the little bit of um, trim work done that needs done in the house that's left. But the house also needs a new roof. We we put a new roof on it before we bought it because the roof was so bad. But the guy that put on the roof was a crook and he did a really shitty job. So now we need a new roof. It's been like four, four years maybe. <laughs> and it, he just did a horrible job roofing it. So I actually had a leak that damaged the bedroom ceiling. And that pissed me off because that was all brand new. I did brand new, we did a lot of brand new sheetrock and texturing and painting. And then this guy, because he was an asshole and did a shitty job on the roof, brand new roof leaked and tore up my ceiling. So now the ceiling is scarred until I can actually get a good repair on it. And I will once the ceiling, once the roof is replaced and it doesn't leak anymore because every once in a while it'll still leak um, we've got gotten up there and repaired everything we can repair and right now it's watertight but it's not going to be for long we got a really good windstorm out of the north that's going to pull those up again and then we're going to be back to where we started so we definitely need to get a new roof on it a, a decent roof on it if I had my way about it, I'd put a metal roof on it. I don't think I'm going to get my way on that, though, because of the expense. But shingles in wind country are kind of a crapshoot, as we found out. All right, well, I'm getting into Ohio. Uh, getting into flatter ground thank god it's about time so i'm going to reset my um, my mileage meter here and see how we're doing oh we're doing much better yeah this is what i was hoping for right now i'm getting 11 i expect to run 11 to 12 miles to the gallon with this load on flat ground maybe better it's just not that heavy. Um, it's pulling really well.
So you can see how the terrain has changed. I mean, it's still hilly, but it's not not as steep and mountainous looking as it was. And as we get over towards Zaneville, it'll get even flatter. So they're still in the early stages of spring, even up here in Ohio. Their trees are not fully leafed out yet either. enough for now. I'll do another one later this afternoon if I get into some different ter territory, maybe out in uh, the upper Midwest here somewhere where it's nice and flat. We'll, we'll take a look at that. Thanks for riding along with me and I'll see you next time.